molecules. And that's going to be proteins and amino acids. Okay, proteins do a lot of the scut work in cells. If you ask what proteins do, I'd recommend asking what proteins don't do in cells because it's a shorter list. Proteins are involved in cell structure, cell signaling, the way the cell detects and responds to things on the outside, cell regulation, a lot of regulation of genes at all levels is due to proteins, metabolism, the vast majority of our enzymes are proteins, the cytoskeleton that moves cells around, all kinds of different things are proteins. And we have thousands of proteins in each cell. As a matter of fact, it's estimated. Now, we have 22,000 protein-coding genes, but by what they call alternate splicing, where you splice different sets of exons together, you can, each gene can code for a whole bunch of related proteins. It's estimated that there are perhaps half a million different types, distinguishing different types of proteins in human cells. That's pretty impressive. That's a lot of proteins. Proteins do all kinds of different things. Now, proteins are polymers made of, okay, that's working, yeah, made of what are called amino acids. Okay, I know, you biochemistry folks, this is old hat, but what is an amino acid? An amino acid is a group of organic molecules that have a couple key features. All amino acids have this here. We have a nitrogen containing amino group at one end. We have a carbon connected to a hydrogen at one end and to something else, more on that later, at the other end. We have a second carbon with an organic acid group on here. So, amino acid. Now, different amino acids vary depending on what's attached to this carbon over here. A lot of times in organic chemistry language they call it the R group. And that R group or side chain, because it hangs off the side of the amino acid, can be any of a number of things. And what that side chain is determines what amino acid it is. For instance, let's suppose we make the simplest amino acid. We'll just stick a hydrogen here. That gives us the amino acid called glycine. That's the simplest and most abundant amino acids in proteins. Now, we could put something else. Let's suppose we have this with another hydroxyl or OH group. That forms amino acid called serine. Or we could put something like this hydrophobic methyl group here, forming the amino acid called valine. Okay, and we can put a number of different things now. Now, in theory, you can make anything that gets attached as an R group, it would still be an amino acid. And not surprising, there's thousands of different potential things you could attach to. Now, fortunately for us, though, only 20 amino acids, 20 different kinds of amino acids, are put together to make proteins. And we can define the properties of amino acids and put them in categories based on what that side chain is. For instance, we could have something polar. So we can have a polar side chain like we saw for serine with the OH group. Here we have a polar amino acid, right? Okay, and that would be a polar amino acid. Not surprisingly, serine would be extremely soluble in water. Now, we could put a hydrophobic group. This is a small hydrophobic group. <coughs> there are others that are much larger and more hydrophobic. And that would give us a hydrophobic amino acid. So the amino acid valine is not, it, it'll dissolve in water somewhat because this hydrophobic group's relatively small, but it's not as soluble in water as, say, serine happens to be. Okay, 
So, and we can have other things. Some amino acids like tyrosine and phenylalanine have that six carbon benzene ring and other stuff coming off it. Those are very hydrophobic amino acids. As a matter of fact, when we do our enzyme lab, we're going to use a modified version of phenylalanine. And it's a pain in the butt to make even a 10 millimolar solution of it. You guys are going to help me out on it. Because it's not very soluble in water. It takes a while to get even 10 millimolar. And that sets uh, 0.1 gram, 0.2 grams for 100 mils of solution. It takes about 10 minutes to get that little bit into the water. Okay? Because it's a hydrophobic amino acid. Okay. Now, some amino acids are going to have, with some others, some may I draw the rest of them, but they're going to have an additional amino group down at the bottom with something else. Those, because those amino groups can pick up a hydrogen ion from solution, just like ammonia, those have a positive charge and they're alkaline or basic. Okay, so we have basic amino acids. The amino acid called lysine, which is a critically important amino acid in dietary terms, is an example of a basic amino acid. Or we could have something that has an additional organic acid at the end of it. And of course that can lose the proton in solution from here. And that makes us a negatively charged or acidic amino acid. And examples of that include aspartic acid, one of the ingredients of aspartame or NutraSweet. I think that'll be a little bit better. Same things. Okay. All right. So we have these four major categories of amino acids. Now I'm just going to put our R group back here. More on amino acids in a little bit. But our next thing we want to do is let's join two amino acids together to start making a protein. Unlike polysaccharides, where the multiple points we can join amino acids together, we can't do that. There's only one connection from one amino acid to the next. What we do here is a classic condensation reaction. We have the amino group of the next amino acid. And what we're going to do is we're going to take this hydroxyl group here and this hydrogen. We're going to pull it away and release as a water molecule. And then we're going to form a covalent bond directly from the carbon of one amino acid to the nitrogen of the next. And we can do that here too. covalent bond between a carbon and a nitrogen. But because of its vast importance, we give it a name. We call this the peptide bond. Aside from its functional importance, and right here, here is another peptide bond, and here is a third one. These are all peptide bonds. They're just carbon to nitrogen covalent bonds. They're moderately strong, but they'll break. You heat it up to about, oh, six, seven hundred degrees Fahrenheit. You usually can break the peptide bonds with heat that way. So proteins start breaking down at those kinds of elevated temperatures because the peptide bonds break. Okay. Now, since it's a covalent, since it's a condensation reaction, of course, every time you assemble amino acids together, you make a pro to make a protein, you have to use energy. Okay, so what we have here now is one, two, three, four amino acids joined together. Now, a little bit of terminology, you may read this in the literature or the textbook or whatever. <coughs> Notice what we have in here. There's only one part of, the pro of this protein where we have a free amino group. In other words, nitrogen with two hydrogens coming off. And at one, that one end we call the N-terminal end. 
So when we see you, you hear about the N terminal M of protein, it means that. It, as a matter of fact, that's actually the first part of the protein that gets synthesized when ribosomes make proteins. The N terminal M is the first thing that goes on. Now over here with that free organic acid, we call that the C terminal M. So that's So in effect, this is the front of the protein, and this is the back of the protein. Now one other thing I'd like to point out here. These R groups are all hanging off the side. We have this kind of backbone-like structure, sometimes known as the peptide backbone. And the R groups hang off to the side. So, Quick and dirty kind of thing. Here we have the peptide backbone. And various side chains coming off the side. And those side chains are very important in giving the different properties of the different amino acids. Okay, so now, one little point here. I draw structures and they say for the most part you don't need to know detailed chemical structures unless I say otherwise. Okay, I'm saying otherwise. You need to know the basic structure of amino acids. I mean, just, I'm not going to ask a specific amino acid. You just stick R for this side chain, okay? So you need to know the basic structure of a generic amino acid. Just put R in as the side chain. I don't care what side chain you're dealing with. You guys have been there, done that a lot worse than this. And you need how to know how to make a peptide bond. In other words, a like common test question, I, I offhand don't even know whether it's on this exam or not, but it could be, is join, draw two amino acids joined together by a peptide bond. Just put R for the side chains. So you have to get that one right. So Because the peptide bond is so important. That's how you, the only way you can join amino acids together to make proteins. Okay, so that's a little bit of how we put these guys together. Now, once again, only 20 amino acids of the thousands of potential amino acids are actually used in making proteins. Now, some of those amino acids and some proteins, enzymes will actually modify certain amino acids and add things. For instance, one protein has at a critical spot a lysine with three hydrophobic methyl groups that they call trimethyl lysine. So, but that happens after protein synthesize. Enzymes add these different things. Most proteins don't have that, by the way. But some have modified amino acids. Now, even though there's 20 amino acids that go into proteins, there are some amino acids that are synthesized by various kinds of cells and various kinds of organisms that are used for different purposes. They have nothing to do with going into proteins. And some of these purposes are as defense mechanisms. We'll put non-protein amino acids. A number of plants produce amino acids that do not go into proteins, but are used as defense mechanisms. Now, if you go out to the American Southwest, there's a common desert bush that's known as local weed. I'm not talking marijuana, okay? That's, that's often we call local weed, too. But no, this is completely different. This particular bush is called that because if cattle go and eat the stuff, they start acting really, really funny, like they're stoned out of their brains, stagger around, and if they eat too much of it, they'll actually die from it. Usually after, if you're a cow, after you had one experience with local weed, I guess it gives you a really, really bad trip and the mother of all hangovers afterwards, you're going to stay away from it. You're not going to feed on that plant anymore. It made you really sick. It made you feel really nasty and gave you a bad trip. Okay. What does that in local weed? It's a neurotoxic amino acid that produces a plant defense mechanism. Generally, if an organism eats local weed, they're probably not going to want to repeat the experience. Now, if you go out to the uh, uh, certain parts of tropical Asia, but especially a number of tropical Pacific, South Pacific islands, 
There is these kinds of plants. They're gymnosperms, and not very common anymore. There used to be tons of them out during the age of the dinosaurs, the Jurassic period, stuff like that. So Jurassic Park was full of these guys. Now they're restricted to certain areas in tropical Asia and certain and a number of South Pacific islands. And these gymnosperms are called cycads, often known and commonly known as sagal palms. They look kind of a little bit like a palm. They've got a squat, barrel-shaped stem with all kinds of fluting on it. And then you have these, pot, these sort of palm-like fronds coming from it. They're not palms. They're actually gymnosperms. Now, in some tropical Pacific islands, that's a major food source. The problem with it is you have to specially prepare it by soaking it in a number of things extensively before you dry the tubers and stuff up and grind it up into flour. Reason why is they produce another different neurotoxic amino acid. If you eat this stuff without properly processing it, you will either get very sick or very dead. The natives of these islands have known that for centuries or thousands of years, however long they've been on those islands and they know how to get the neurotoxic amino acids out. Even so, an interesting side light is many of those islands have very high rates of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. It's suspected that the tiny residuals of these neurotoxic amino acids <coughs> left are enough to cause long-term destruction of motor nerve cells over a period of years or decades. They have unusually high rates and seems to be restricted to the islands or sago palms or cycads are a major food source. Okay, so even though all the cleaning doesn't get rid of their last bit of it, but once again, it's a neurotoxic amino acid as a defense mechanism. So, once again, unless you prepare it, if you're an animal eating, you don't know how to prepare this stuff properly, so you get really, really sick, and then you're going to stay away from these guys from that point on. Okay, so we have certain kinds of neurotoxic amino acids. Okay, one last thing before we go into more details on proteins. The idea of joining chains of amino acids together, no branches and stuff, protein, not polysaccharide. If you have a large chain of amino acids, we call it a protein. And maybe, although it's indeterminate, maybe you're talking about over 50 amino acids long. I mean, it's kind of a little in, indeterminate. Over. Okay. Now, if you have a small chain of amino acids, which is generally referred to as usually less than 50, it's usually more like a few tens. We call those things a peptide. So peptides are short chains of amino acids. Now, it turns out peptides have all kinds of biological roles, too. All kinds of peptides are synthesized for various biological purposes. Many hormones that we have in our bodies, and hormones that are found in bodies of other organisms, not just vertebrates, but others, are actually small peptides. And those include things such as what's called substance P, which is involved in pain sensation, a number of these so-called releasing factors that stimulate things like steroid hormone productions. All those gonadotrophin. There are peptide neurotransmitters that send signals from one nerve cell to the next. An example of that, actually a couple of examples of peptide neurotransmitters, and not the only ones. It turns out that opiates, either the natural product, either the natural product of the poppy plant, or the many synthetic versions around. Somebody won a Nobel Prize to find out how opiates worked. He radioactively labeled morphine and gave it to mice, and then he started finding with biochemical techniques, what is that opium 
what is that morphine bound to? And he ground up mice brains and stuff, and after years of painstaking work, he found that it bound to a particular protein, which he called the opiate receptor. Now, if you have this protein, it's unlikely that a mouse would develop a protein specifically designed to bind some plant product, especially since they would rarely encounter that, considering where poppies normally grow and where mice normally are found. Most mice would never experience eating a poppy, right? Okay, well, so it suggested that there must be some natural opiates in our own brains. And sure enough, they were identified. They're called the endorphins, and they're, they're peptides synthesized from larger precursors called enkephalins. You make this larger peptide and chop part of it out, and what's left is the endorphin. So in other words, those are the natural opiates. And they're involved in things like a sensation of mood, pain regulation, things like that. And what happens is opiates actually mimic the effects of the of the endorphins, and that's what causes these various kinds of effects. Now, somebody did the same thing with marijuana. Why would this plant resin cause such dramatic effects? Okay, well, here again, they found that there were receptors that bound to THCs, the active ingredients in marijuana, and not surprisingly, they found the peptide equivalent that happens normally and is called the ananidins. And these are peptides that stimulate the, you want to call it marijuana receptors. As a matter of fact, interesting sidelight on that. It's not, it, they're taking it off the market in Europe now, never got FDA approved in the United States, but the first thing Somebody developed a diet drug that would reduce appetite. And it worked by inhibiting one of the two classes of ananidine receptors. Now, of course, those of you who may have partaken in herbal remedies perhaps are aware of what's sometimes called the munchies, a vast increase of appetite. Trust me, it is real. <laughs> okay, well, if you have or have heard about it or what have you, what this thing is, is an anti-munchy drug. It blocks that one of the two classes of receptors that's also involved in ramping up appetite. So it ramps the appetite down. Now the problem is, and this is why it got taken off the market, never FDA approved in the United States, is they were finding it also dropped people's moods down, people that were already kind of on the depressed side, it could push them over limits. So they, found they were finding a much higher suicide rate of people that were using this diet drug. So, it never, the FDA in the U.S. got suspicious and never approved it for use in the United States. The European Union, if they haven't already taken it off the market, they are about to do so because there's enough data in that it is probably does more harm than good. But the way it worked was actually to block one of these kinds of receptors. Unfortunately, it had a whole bunch of side effects in terms of mood control and stuff like that. People that were already on the depressed side, in some cases, got pushed over the edge. Uh, so, it's going to be out there. Nice try, but didn't quite work. Okay, well, now, not only do we have these kinds of things, many organisms use peptides as defense or offense mechanisms. And that falls into the venoms and toxins category. There are all kinds of nasty peptide toxins. Many of them are neurotoxic. They affect specifically certain aspects of nerve transmission or neuronal function. Examples, spiders have witches brews of multiple proteins and peptides, each with specific neurotoxic effects. Some of them are very narrow defined. There's a lot of interest in people are isolating the venoms of various tarantulas. Each species often has their own specific as well as some common neurotoxic peptides. And they're looking at that for potential drugs for clinical use. One of the most notorious venomous organisms on the planet 
is something called a cone shell. It's a little marine snail. They only grow about this big and they're called cone shells because their shells are like a cone. They're a gastropod. Now they modify their little scraping tongue, or radula, into a hollow harpoon-like structure connected to a venom gland. And what these guys will do is they will fire out that harpoon into a target and then pump venom into it. Now there are cone shells all over the world. In fact, there's cone shells off of Florida and Caribbean coasts and stuff. If you pick those guys up, they will give you a nasty, rather painful stick. But there are some cone shells in the Indo-Pacific area, the geographic cone, which is not only rare, it is also deadly. It's so toxic that if it stings you, you're dead in about two hours and there's nothing they can, there's no antidote for this thing. People are investigating these different cone shell venoms or what they call conotoxins. There are proteins, but most of these things are witch's brew of scores, even hundreds of different individual neurotoxic peptides, and each species has a different complement of them. The potential of these things for clinical uses is quite impressive. In fact, nowadays there is out, it just got FDA approved last year, a pain drug to deal with pain that's intractable by the usual things with opiates and stuff like that. It's a pain drug. It is not an opiate. It does not affect the opiate receptor at all. Instead, it affects only one particular type of one particular class of neurotransmitter receptors. And it can relieve pain. It's a thousand times as powerful as morphine, so little goes a long way on it. It's out FDA approval. Got FDA approval last year. It is derived from one of the hundreds of peptides in a particular species of cone shell. There are more potential things on the way. And of course, with people with chronic pain, the more pain drugs, especially non-addictive pain drugs, so you can't go and sell it to the teenager next door or what have you, and the doctors don't have to worry about the dark squads beating down their door and throwing them in jail, the more powerful non-opiate pain relievers around the bed. So there's a lot of research on that. Once again, these are peptide, neurotoxic peptides produced by specific organisms as a defense or as a feeding mechanism. So peptides have a lot of different roles in cells and in organisms. And this here is a good place to take a bit of a break. So we will do that and then we'll start looking at proteins.